Okay, so welcome everybody to Moran's PhD seminar. Uh, a few words about Moran. So, so Moran uh, finished his BC degree, Kama Laude, from mechanical engineer in Technion. Um, he then continued to his MSc degree in the Technion Thermal Systems Program, TAS, and finished the MSc degree in 2020. And he's been pursuing his PhD degree in TAS since 2021. Okay, go ahead, Okay, so uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, so today's lecture is about simplifying uh, PondDP algorithms with performance guarantees. And specifically, the scope of this lecture is about sequential decision making under uncertainty. So there are many, uh, many real world examples, but uh, for instance, let's consider this autonomous vehicle. So in order to make uh, smart decisions, an autonomous vehicle uh, need to consider um, both the road and the conditions of the road, but not just that, he also needs to reason about other agents and also other agents' actions, uh, which basically leads to uh, randomness. Uh, for instance, consider the case where we have uh, a, a camera as a sensor mounted on the vehicle, and we see the environment only through this camera. So once uh, a vehicle is occluded, uh, for instance, by some truck or a bus, uh, we don't actually see it, but we know it is there. Uh, but we are uncertain about its actual uh, location. So this kind of problems is tackled by uh, the decision making under uncertainty. And more formally, uh, we're focusing on a partially observable Markov decision processes, also known as uh, PONDPs. And let's start with some formalism. So uh, we denote the state uh, X, uh, and the state is all the information the agent uh, needs to know, uh, which is uh, relevant for his task. Uh, the action is denoted as A, and this is the actual uh, action that the agent can take in the real world. Then we have an observation, and an observation is similar to the uh, uh, problem that we've described before. Well, um, yeah, can, can you please mute? Thank you. Um, so an observation it only uh, may only contain sometimes part, uh, part of the information that we actually uh, need to know, um, but this is our only access to the real world. Uh, then we have the world, which is a function that maps a state and an action to how good it is, is it to take an action in state X. Uh, the transition function uh, shown here is basically uh, given the uh, state and the action, what is the probability of being in uh, state X type, uh, t plus one. Uh, the observation function gives us the likelihood of observing uh, of getting some observation given uh, a state X. Then we have the pile distribution, which is uh, a distribution over the states uh, at time step T0. And the horizon, which is denoted as capital T here, um, basically uh, represents the number of steps that the agent uh, considers when doing playing. So uh, just a few more notations before we continue to the more interesting stuff. Uh, we denote history as AHT, and history is a set that includes uh, the prior belief, then the action, uh, A0, that the agent took at time step zero, uh, observed an observation uh, denoted as Z1, and this continues recursively until time step T. Uh, then we have a belief, a BT, which represents the distribution over uh, the states given the history. Uh, we have the policy, and the policy is the function that maps the current belief to an action. And finally, we have the value function, and a value function is an important metric which tells us how good is it to be in a, cer in a certain belief, in a certain uh, time step, given uh, some policy. And this is uh, more uh, more detailed. Uh, this is just the expectation over the cumulative future rewards by following a policy pi. And we can also write it in terms of uh, Bellman equation shown below here, which is the reward plus the expected future value function. 
So given this information, um, what are the solutions for solving a PomDP? So we'll be focusing on online research methods. Um, where uh, in, in this tree, uh, each node represents a belief. So then uh, each edge either represents an action or an observation that we receive from the environment. And given the prior belief, the action and observation, um, we can compute the posterior belief, um, which is usually done uh, via probabilistic inference. So how can we find the exact solution for this problem? So ideally, what we would want to do is given a PomDP definition, we could construct a tree that includes all possible states, actions, and observation. However, uh, this is a bit problematic since the size of the tree grows exponentially with the horizon. And more specifically, uh, it goes exponentially with the number of states and observations in the state space. So this is only relevant for very small PomDP problems. Then we must resort to, uh, resort to approximate planners. So let's consider just a few of those. Um, so there are uh, gradient-based open loop solvers. Uh, so these solvers are efficient, but they are not aware of the state uncertainty, which is the actual problem that we are trying to solve. So they cannot be optimal. Um, there are also deterministic approximations, which are obviously also efficient, but they are not aware of the state of certainty and again, not optimal. Then we have this important class of approximate solvers, uh, which are called Monte Carlo, uh, which all use uh, Monte Carlo sampling. And this, uh, sol these solvers are both uh, e efficient in terms of planning. They are aware of the state uncertainty. And depending on the algorithm, they may have some sense of optimality. So here's a short list of some very common and known state-of-the-art uh, PomDP solvers, which all use Monte Carlo sampling. Now let's go to our approach. So in this research, uh, we derive a framework that instead of solving, instead of solving uh, the original problem, which is uh, computationally intensive, we consider a simplified version of that PomDP. So here, the simplified version we denoted as M with the bar. So uh, all the bar notations in this presentation basically correspond to a simplified version of the original uh, of the original PomDP. Then uh, we aim at deriving a mathematical relationship between the solution of the simplified PomDP and the, the theoretical PomDP. So the theoretical PomDP is the problem that we actually want to solve, but it is computationally expensive. So we solve the simplified one, and we ask what is the mathematical connection uh, between those two problems. OK, now uh, let's talk a, a little bit about our works. Um, so we'll start with uh, belief-dependent rewards. And this is based on our published uh, work in uh, IJCAI. Um, so what are uh, belief-dependent rewards? So they are a generalization of uh, PomDPs. So as you recall uh, from our introduction, uh, PomDPs are usually limited to state-based reward. And uh, sorry. And uh, belief-dependent reward, they support explicit reasoning of uncertainty. So why do we care about uh, re explicit reasoning about uncertainty? So uh, let's take an example, this uh, map representation, and look at the figure uh, on the middle here. So we have a robot that moves in the in this floor. And the goal of this robot is to map the environment. So uh, defining this goal with a state-dependent world is uh, a bit challenging. And it is um, more natural to define this goal in terms of uh, belief-dependent worlds. So there are uh, different kinds of belief-dependent worlds. Uh, but some of the most common ones are information theoretic functions, uh, which may be used as, uh, as uncertainty measures. Uh, so for instance, uh, there is the differential entropy. Uh, this is a very uh, common function for belief-based rewards, but there are also others such as information gain, mutual information, scale divergence, and others. In this paper, 
we've focused on entropy as an information theoretic function. And we've defined the reward um, as a weighted sum of the state dependent reward, which is the standard definition in quantity, uh, and an entropy. So uh, th this formulation can be either discrete or, or continuous. But the difficulty with information theoretic function uh, is that uh, for the continuous case, these are generally intractable. And even approximations, uh, these are computationally difficult because uh, they are squared to the number of uh, state samples in the state space. And this, uh, this computation needs to be done for every world calculation, which is done for every belief node in the tree. So obviously this is uh, computationally challenging. So the naive approach, uh, what we would do is like, like we've just mentioned, we would want to compute this uh, reward value in every uh, belief node. But instead what we suggest is doing some abstract approach where we take a cluster of these posterior nodes and for each cluster, we only compute a single reward value. So in this uh, specific example, instead of computing uh, the reward for each belief independently, uh, we cluster three uh, posterior nodes and calculate this reward once. And we will show uh, later on that we can bound the loss between this naive approach and the abstract approach. But then we can take another step forward um, and refine this abstraction such that we can still get computational efficiency, but there is no loss in terms of the output policy between the naive approach and the refined approach. How this is done in practice. So we have introduced an abstract observation model. And this abstract observation model basically aggregates a set of K observations. Um, and we, and the, the simplified observation model basically has its probability value as the aggregate average. So let's look at a more specific example. So on the a graph to the right, you can see different uh, observations and each observation have different probability value. And instead of using uh, this original observation function, we use an abstract observation function, which uh, take a set of observations and calculate the, the mean of this set and uses this instead of the original probability value. And we can also do a similar thing for the continuous case. So just to mention, usually in the continuous case, we don't actually hold the continuous belief because calculating continuous belief in general is intractable. Um, but instead what we use is we use samples from this belief, uh, also known as particles. So we can do a similar thing to the particles where each particle we use the average weight and cluster cluster them into a single uh, into a single uh, particle. Using this abstract observation model, we derived analytical bounds compared to the non-abstract model, um, in which the difference between the theoretical value function and the abstract value function can be bounded. So uh, let's uh, look a little bit further into the details of this uh, inequality. So the first part uh, is the value function that uh, represents the abstract approach or the, the simplified value function. And the second part is uh, the naive approach. So we don't actually want to compute this naive approach. We just calculate the value, the simplified value function, which is easier to compute um, and, and use it as a proxy uh, to bound the theoretical value function, which we don't have access to. So a bit more about the notations here. Uh, so capital T denotes the horizon, uh, omega two is the entropy weight, and K is the number of clusters, uh, clustered observations. Let's uh, state some interesting observation about this result. First, uh, as you recall, we have defined the reward uh, as the sum of state dependent reward and entropy. But from this uh, inequality, you can see that there is no loss for abstracting the state dependent reward. Then uh, this bound can be made adaptive 
by reducing the size of K. Um, so if we uh, extract, uh, so if we reduce the size of K in this bound, we can basically uh, reduce the, the size of this bound. And once K reaches to one, uh, this difference is bounded from below and uh, from above by zero, which basically means that the simplified uh, value function is exactly like the uh, theoretical value function. And finally, K doesn't actually need to remain constant throughout the tree, although this is the example that we show here. Um, but this is a bit more nuanced, so please refer to the paper if you are interested in the details. Okay, so let's jump to the results. Um, here we can see, uh, basically we ran two algorithms. So the first algorithm is some baseline algorithm. And the second algorithm uh, user is, is pretty similar, but it uses our adaptive approach where we uh, create a solution and we basically measure the time that it takes for each of these algorithms uh, to find the solution. So uh, the first graph is the time versus the observation branching factor. And the second graph is the time uh, to the number of state particles that we've used. So what we basically seeing here is speed up for free. So what does that mean? Both algorithms provided the exact same policy. So this uh, the exact same solution, but in terms of the planning time, we got a significant speed up um, compared to the naive approach. Okay, let's uh, move on to the second part of this lecture. And this second part uh, simplifies the state space. And here we consider discrete continuous state space, uh, state spaces. And this is based on our uh, published papers, uh, both uh, submitted uh, and uh, published in all. Um, so why do we actually care about continuous discrete state spaces? So as an accompanying example, consider the case of ambiguous data associations. And ambiguous data associations um, is the case where the source of the observation is not certain. So let's look at the figure, figure A. Um, so we have a robot, but the position of the robot is not certain. So we have a distribution about this position. And this distribution is basically uh, represented in this figure as this blue ellipse. So we are not sure uh, exactly where the location of the robot is. And once we get an observation, uh, which is pretty limited, as you can see in this example, we are not sure whether or not this observation was originated from beta one or beta two. So we call beta one and beta two uh, hypothesis. And we need to, to use this information to make an educated uh, guess what would be a good action to take. Then if we just uh, assume that we got this observation from beta one, then great, we update our belief. So as you can see, the new belief is smaller and it, it is uh, represents pretty good the, uh, the position of the robot. Uh, then we can directly try and reach the green, uh, the green star. But instead, if we mistakenly assume that the observation source was originated from beta two, then the while we try to reach the green star, we would actually reach this pit, which uh, might lead to a dangerous situation. So optimally, what we wish to do is instead consider um, both hypotheses and maybe first gather more information by observing, I'm sorry, uh, observing some unique feature from the environment and then hold a distribution over the hypothesis. Then given this distribution, we may consider maybe taking uh, different actions to gather more information. Or if we decide that this information is sufficient, we can directly try and reach the, the gold star. So as you can understand, uh, the optimality requires reasoning about different hypotheses. Then computing the world function also requires knowledge of this hypothesis. However, unfortunately, the number of hypotheses 
uh, might go exponentially with the horizon. So let's uh, consider the following example where we have a belief tree. Um, and given this uh, uh, pile distribution B0, uh, we may take action A0 and observe an observation uh, Z1 and reach to B1. But if we have a hypothesis, then maybe this file distribution only have a single hypothesis, but once getting an observation, this single hypothesis may go to two different hypotheses. And then taking another action and observing a new potentially ambiguous observation, each one of those hypotheses additionally go to two new hypotheses. And this process continues recursively, uh, which unfortunately uh, explodes to an exponential growth in the number of hypotheses. So what others have done to deal with this problem? So they either uh, implicitly assume a known observation source, and this, this is the category where most state-of-the-art server, servers uh, uh, reside, or uh, if uh, the algorithms uh, do uh, have uh, assuming information about a different hypothesis, um, they may prune hypothesis based on some heuristics. But it is not too hard to show that a pruned set of hypotheses leads to a biased estimation of the value function. So what's our contribution? Uh, we suggest that instead of computing all possible hypotheses, we utilized a notion of uh, MCTS algorithm, where MCTS stands for Monte Carlo Tree Search. And uh, we use MCTS sampling and exploration approach. So let's uh, briefly describe what MCTS is. MCTS is an MDP solver, where MDP stands for Markov Decision Process. Um, and it uses a notion that's called UCT to trade off exploration and exploitation for actions. So what UCT is? So UCT is basically uh, Q hat here denotes just the average of the uh, future rewards that we have observed during planning, um, plus some hyperparameter called C and uh, an exploration bonus. So this C basically weights how much we want to use the explore the exploration bonus versus exploiting the information that we already know, which is here denoted as the Q hat. So let's, uh, let's see how this algorithm MCTS work. We start by uh, selecting uh, an, a, a posterior belief. So we start from uh, the root, then take an action, get an observation, and we are now located in a posterior belief denoted here as this uh, green circle. Then we select an action and expand this tree to have uh, a new posterior node denoted here as this uh, red circle. And then we perform rollout. Um, and in this rollout, what we basically want to achieve is just uh, an estimation of the value function, but we don't use this information and add it to the tree. We just use the, the information of the reward that we got to finally uh, make back propagation in which we update um, the parameters of the UCT, which is the Q hat, um, the mean of the uh, expected cumulative reward and the, uh, hyper the parameters of the uh, exploration bonus. So our contribution was to add a layer to this, uh, to this MCTS approach, where we additionally don't only uh, sample posterior nodes, but we also sample hypothesis uh, using Monte Carlo sampling approach. So let's uh, start by looking at the uh, selection one, uh, the selection figure. Then we select only a single hypothesis. And then given this single hypothesis, we expand only a single new hypothesis. And when doing this approach uh, iteratively many times, we add uh, more and more hypotheses as uh, time continues. 
And this approach tends to sample the more uh, important hypothesis. And this property is also uh, basically due to the MCTS approach. And we've shown in the paper that it can also support belief dependent rewards. Um, so we have derived a corresponding reward estimator. So this is not just uh, an intuition uh, based approach because uh, we, uh, we've we also derived some uh, theoretical uh, contribution. And this R hat basically represents our approximation uh, for the uh, reward and then for the value function. And we've shown that it leads to an unbiased estimator. Then we made another contribution. And the idea here is that uh, computing the full hypothesis tree is too computationally expensive. So we don't want to do this. But instead, what we want to do is just use uh, consider a subset of this hypothesis. So here we have derived a deterministic bound that relates the full set of hypotheses to a subset of hypotheses such that for any policy pi and selection of hypothesis set, so unlike the previous uh, contribution that we have discussed that we must use Monte Carlo sampling to sample hypothesis, here we can choose the hypothesis arbitrarily. And we show that the following holds. So again, we have the uh, value function, uh, which corresponds to the full tree. So this is just a theoretical value, which we don't hold in practice. Instead, what we do is use this subset tree, the simplified value function. And we've shown that this is bounded from above. And importantly, uh, this bound um, only relies on the available hypothesis. So we can actually bound the theoretical value with access only to the simplified tree. OK, so let's have a look at uh, some results. Here we have uh, the value estimation uh, relative to some tunable loss limit. So we have devised an algorithm, which we can, uh, given a, a hyperparameter, we can control how much we want to simplify the problem uh, in uh, and get in return a, a more time efficient algorithm. And the graph to the right basically represents the uh, planning time relative to the same allowable loss, which is the tunable hyperparameter that we have. So obviously, as you can see from these two graphs, um, the more we simplify uh, the, the problem, uh, the more time efficient this algorithm uh, becomes. And we've also noticed that even with a small uh, allowable loss, um, we can get significant improvement in terms of the computational time that it takes for the algorithm to find uh, the policy. OK, let's move now to the third part of this lecture, um, where we've uh, used the uh, insights from both simplifying the observation space and simplifying the state space. And we have clustered them into uh, a single algorithm. And this is based on our published work, which was used in a, uh, which was published in a new rips. And we are currently working on an extended ver uh, version of this, uh, which is to be submitted. Okay, so let's have a, a short reminder. So a POMDP is a formal framework for decision-making under uncertainty. And finding an optimal policy is generally intractable. So we must resort to approximate solvers. And I would just note that in this section, uh, we only consider discrete spaces. So state-of-the-art approximate solvers rely on sampling. Uh, they they uh, use sampling to just choose a subset of the state and the observation spaces. Naturally, using sampling comes with probabilistic theoretical guarantees. So uh, you can see here uh, the theorems of different papers. Uh, all these uh, algorithms are currently considered state of the art, uh, such as a despot and ad ops and POM CP. And they all provide uh, probabilistic guarantees. And sometimes, uh, such as POMCP, 
they don't even provide finite time guarantees. They just state that with infinite time, this will converge to the optimal solution. So here we are asking the question whether or not we can get deterministic guarantees and not just probabilistic ones. So in this work, we show that the answer is yes. So given a palm dp, and this is the original palm dp, m, we defined a simplified version of this palm dp, denoted here as m bar. And uh, we, we simplify specifically the state and the observation spaces, which are subset of the original state and observation spaces. And then for the probability models, um, we're doing the following simplification. So let's look at the prior belief as an example. So um, the, the, the simplified prior belief either receives uh, the original value if the state is within the simplified uh, state space, or if it isn't, it just returns zero. And we do similar thing for the transition function and the observation model. So clearly using just a subset of the state and observation spaces is, uh, may lead to far more efficient uh, solution than using the uh, theoretical um, complete uh, state and observation spaces. Then with this simplified palm dp, we also define a simplified value function, which uses the models that we've just seen. Um, so uh, you can see in this example, what we would want to compute in this figure is the left tree, but this is uh, quite uh, uh, difficult in, in terms of the computational complexity. And you can see that this tree is quite dense. But instead, what we are doing is uh, using this simplified tree here on the right, where we just take the subset of uh, the states and observations. So we have derived uh, lower and upper bounds for the optimal value function. And note that the bounds here it, uh, are uh, relative to the optimal value function. Uh, uh, which is a, a pretty strong uh, theoretical uh, contribution. And these bounds are obviously easier to compute than the optimal value function. And additionally, they have some other desirable properties such as uh, they can shrink monotonically as the algorithm explore more parts of the tree. It converges to the optimal value function such that when the uh, lower bound uh, is equal to the upper bound, We've known that we know that we have reached the optimal value function. And um, to the best of our knowledge, this is uh, the first paper to provide a deterministic guarantees for uh, any time online found dps. So we understand that we can use these bounds during planning, but uh, what, uh, what are we actually doing with this bound? So how can we use them in practice? Um, so a few ideas. First, uh, we can use them to prune suboptimal branches, and this is only made possible by the deterministic guarantees. Um, so how do we do pruning? Uh, let's take a look at the graph to the right, where we have different actions, A1 to A4. Um, each one of the actions have lower and upper bounds for the value function. So the optimal value function uh, must reside within the highest upper bound, and the highest uh, lower bound. So we have this optimal band here, uh, here shown as this uh, uh, green uh, rectangle. And once uh, an action, uh, uh, once an action has its interval below the optimal interval, we can deem it as uh, some op suboptimal and prune this entirely. And basically, we don't just prune this action; we prune the entire subtree that this action corresponds to. So uh, uh, this leads to computational efficiency. Additionally, uh, we can use a similar notion for, uh, for a stopping criteria of this entire uh, algorithm. Since we have the lower and upper bounds for the optimal value function, we may allow for uh, some level of loss. And we can tell deterministically when it is fine to stop the search and use the solution that we got so far. Um, and additionally, 
uh, we can find the optimal solution in finite time. And obviously, uh, this can be done when recovering the entire theoretical tree. But in this paper, we show that we can do that. Uh, we can do that uh, without recovering uh, the entire tree. Um, so a bit more about our uh, contribution. Uh, we have also derived an algorithm. So the first part of this algorithm is basically just a blueprint of an algorithm. And this structure uh, represents most of state-of-the-art algorithms because they all, they all uh, rely on Monte Carlo sampling and they have pretty much uh, the same structure. Then we've shown that we can attach our bounds to any such algorithm that have this uh, similar structure. So let's uh, have a look at some specific example. Here we consider an algorithm called POMCP. And POMCP, in essence, is very similar to the Monte Carlo research that we have discussed before. It uses um, UCT uh, to trade off um, exploitation and exploration. But instead of uh, you, uh, using UCT uh, uh, for states, we are doing uh, UCT for a belief. So POMCP uses UCT both for uh, exploration, which is building the tree, and the final decision making, which is uh, deciding which action to take in the real world. Then we take this algorithm and use, uh, use our approach by attaching to it our deterministic bounds. So we call this new algorithm deterministically bounded POMCP. And in this algorithm, we use our bounds and specifically the highest lower bound to select an action to perform in the real world once the planning session has ended. But notably, um, we don't use our bounds for the exploration inside the tree. Then we have a third version, uh, which we called root bound POMCP. And in this root bound POMCP, we use our bounds uh, both for the final decision making and for exploration within the tree. So some, uh, so some details about the properties of these algorithms. The first algorithm, POMCP, uh, cannot provide deterministic guarantees. And it can also not do pruning, and it cannot provide finite time optimality. Then our first adaptation, um, which uses the bound, can provide deterministic guarantees. It can do pruning, but still it cannot do finite. It cannot provide finite time optimality. And basically, this is because uh, the UCT approach uh, uses sampling, so we cannot guarantee that we find the, the optimal solution in finite time. Then the third algorithm, root-bound POMCP, uh, provides both deterministic guarantees, can do pruning, and can provide finite time optimality guarantees. So let's jump to the results. Um, here we have basically compared the time it takes for the algorithms to find the optimal action. And importantly, each point here uh, in this graph corresponds to the time uh, that it took for the algorithm to find the optimal action um, versus the playing horizon. So as we increase the playing horizon, obviously the complexity of the problem increases. Um, notably, state-of-the-art algorithms were excluded because we cannot tell whether or not they have found the optimal solution. So we did not consider him. Uh, we do not consider them uh, in this graph. Although we did add the, added them, uh, we added POM CP to the legend, but just, this is just uh, to emphasize that we cannot add it to this graph. Um, then we have the deterministically bounded POM CP, um, which provides, uh, can find the optimal action until uh, horizon four in this example. But then it effectively stops exploring before guaranteeing the optimal solution. And this is because of the property of the uh, UCB exploration exploitation trade-off, 
which doesn't actually guarantee that we find the optimal solution. And at some point, it basically just fixate on a single uh, action. Then we have our third approach, uh, root-bound POMCP, which uh, finds the optimal action for all the horizons that we have considered. And uh, we empirically seen that it scales linearly with the problem size or alternatively the problem complexity. Okay, so uh, let's have a summary to, to what we have seen. Um, we've started with a brief introduction about PomDPs in general. Then we have simplified the observation space to increase the efficiency of belief dependent rewards. Um, then we uh, simplified the state space when considered discrete continuous state spaces. And there we have considered a specific example where we've had different hypotheses uh, which corresponds to the uh, ambiguous data association problem. And finally, we used insights from the previous uh, two approaches to simplify both the, the state and the observation spaces uh, to provide guarantees for the optimal solution. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Moran. Uh, we have time for questions. Anybody wants to ask? Now's the time. Final call for questions. Okay. So thank you so much, Moran. It was very interesting. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Bye.